Keep Kelly on the muzzle when you bring her to the house. No shoes in the house. What? I mean, you don't even have a carpet. And can none of your friends use my shower? You're being dumb extra right now. Park right here. How long? Uh, I just need to do a quick walkthrough and give the landlord my keys. This is how I hitchhike. Huh. Woo! Three, two, one. Ah! Taxi. Hey. Ah. I, Alexis, take thee, Ben, to be my lawfully wedded husband-wife, to have and to hold, for poor or for poor, because God knows you're so f***ing poor. You have no money. Did you even go to school? Can you spell art degree? You do know the shower gets wet when you turn it on, right? My angel, us together, forever, me paying for everything. You know, we saw some of your videos, which is a great way to start, but I would like to start with Alexis. If you could give us a, a little bit about your background, kind of the, the quick version of, of how you got your start. Sure. Uh, the very quick version is from age two to age 13 in my life, I was a competitive gymnast, which is very different than this. Uh, and I ended up getting an injury, and so it sort of turned my whole life around, and that's how I started getting interested in acting, and I started doing local classes, and through that is how I found YouTube, and I had all this free time because I wasn't doing like the one thing I had been doing my whole life, so I got really into making videos and started coming out to Los Angeles for auditions and ended up moving out here, and then two years after I had been making videos once a week, I had 500 subscribers, and like that's it. Um, and then I ended up, I met this YouTuber at a party who I really liked her videos and I gave her my business card and she shouted me out on YouTube and that's really how I got my start in terms of making content for an actual human audience. Uh, and then since then I've just been working on growing my channel as well as like acting and getting more into writing and directing and turning my channel more into like a scripted short form platform. Okay. And how about you, Jean? Well, um, it wasn't as eventful as that. It was more so like I heard a radio ad on when I was driving through Providence, and I decided to try it out and see what it was look like. And when I did the radio ad, I ended up, I felt it was a scam, and I ended up going to do a finding a Craigslist job doing background in a independent short film at URI, and that actually worked out. And that was like my first experience. I thought I was gonna do background, and they ended up putting me in the play in the movie itself. And I improv the whole scene, and they loved it. And I thought there was maybe something there. And I ended up doing another independent short film in Boston. And then I finally decided, you know, I might try to do this for real. And I moved over. To, I moved to LA. Um, in LA, six months into me living out here, I ended up doing Project X. I went from being background in the movie to one of the leads, um, a day player. And then the next thing was Nike commercials. After that, and then. I got into YouTube and Vine because I was tired of waiting for people to hire me, so I started creating my own content. And I got, and then I got offered, I was taking acting class as well, then I got offered a role on Alvin and Chipmunks. Then I started auditioning and got, uh, I created a short film that went to the film festival, then I got American Crime, and then I auditioned for HBO early this year and then got Insecure. And that's where I'm at now. And Zach? I had uh, not been, I had applied to film school because I always wanted to be a film director, go down to Hollywood. Uh, I was a Northwest kid and I applied, didn't get in. And all of a sudden I was like, I, I really want to be creating film projects. So I started a YouTube channel out of that um, kind of boredom at my freshman year of college down here at Biola University. And all of a sudden I was creating these tutorials. I was recording my screen and screen capturing my computer to show how to edit in Final Cut Pro. It was very nerdy. I had about 30,000 followers. 
But I noticed something interesting in the comments and the people were saying, you know, instead of doing these cool lightsaber effects, why don't you add a story to it so we can kind of see a range of your effects live within a narrative. So I created the next day a video called Jedi Kittens with literally two kittens with lightsabers battling. It's still on YouTube to this day. And I, I had posted it, made it in 24 hours, posted it the next day, woke up and it had like a million views plus. And we were like, what is this, this internet YouTube thing? Can we make a career out of it? So we made you know several more, and now I'm a cat sellout. Now I use cats for a lot of projects because they're, they're hugely popular on the internet. Um, but that's how I started and just growing a channel ever since and, and now um, kind of about, I don't know, 20 or 30 million followers on across our different <laughs> socials now um, over the last eight, nine years just because we're kind of learning how to tell stories to the younger audience that's on mobile. So, Bo, Full Screen is working with all of these storytellers, these creators, in who all had very different stories about how they got to where they are now. I'm curious, before we dive into some of the questions I have for you about kind of the industry at large, it might be helpful for you to explain how Full Screen is working with, with each of these, or in general, how you're working with talent, because oftentimes you get kind of lumped in with, with the MCNs, these multi-channel networks, and you guys are doing a lot more than that and working with the talent in a much different way. Yeah, I think someone said it earlier today, uh, this idea of you know going back pre-YouTube, I think it was Steve, um, you had to be in LA or New York and have an agent and audition and they have to know somebody at Sony and that's how you got in kind of thing, right? Um, and Jean still kind of live in that life and started in that kind of very traditional setup of I'm just gonna pound the pavement and audition and go that way. Um, what I think changed with social, started with YouTube and then Facebook and everything else is, uh, Steve said, democratization of talent, right? You can come from anywhere and I think what the MCNs when they started were trying to address was um, the scale of talent, just the sheer volume of humans that were now creating content. And in a world where anyone can access what used to be a very narrow world, the, the, the service, the tool set had to change, right? And so uh, today, full screen is everything in terms of serving talent from social optimization and brand deals and kind of the stuff we used to consider nuts and bolts of MCN business to booking people in shows and uh, we've invested in our own nascent SPOD network. Um, we find we finance content, we have a 400 person brand unit who's doing about $100 million a year in deals for talent. Um, so we've, we just look at it as the evolution of servicing talent. Uh, you would have called it an agency before, now you just call it full screen. And, and you came from an agency, you were at WMU before this. So how, how do you have to service talent differently today? Uh, what, what has changed in your mind from from what it means to be talent in 2017 versus you know even 10 years ago? It's just broader, right? Uh, kittens doing Jedi fighting wasn't uh, a, a you know a time slot that was sold on CBS in 2001 or whatever, right? And I think that um, again, content's democratized, and in a world where you know, the, the, the easiest way, we, I have a slide in a deck somewhere, it basically says in 2000 whatever, there were 100 cable networks and they were all distributing basically through Comcast or, you know, the laid pipe. And when you think about the interim distribution points now, you've got social networks, you've got SVOD, you've got, still have linear TV, you've got O&O sites and things like that. So the complexity has just gotten so much greater. And on top of that, you've just got way more talent out there um, or people trying to break through. So. Discovery becomes more of a, of a thing, you know, historically it was you're nobody and then you book a role and now you're somebody, right? Um, it's much kind of more organic. Alexis has been building it for years, right? And I think, and Zach too, and I think that that's um, great, frankly. I just think it's much, it's a much more open environment for everybody. So, Alexis, given that maybe 10 years ago, if you'd wanted to, to come to Hollywood, you would have gone that more traditional route, how do you feel like YouTube impacted or altered kind of your path? Sure, I think, 
both acting helped YouTube and YouTube help acting because I sort of have gone through the whole traditional like auditioning and I still do that and that's still like the route that I'm pursuing but while I'm on set I get the opportunity to learn about like lighting and to see what like how it all works and then I can take the skills that I learn while being on you know a set with like tons of people to me being on a set with like two or three people. Uh, so I think that they've both really helped each other. And then in terms of like YouTube helping acting, it's just the more like people that you have as an audience, the more you can take that audience to you know casting and you can say, hey, hire me and I will bring this with me. Um, it, it's just a bonus really. And it just helps you get in rooms and it helps you you know just get more eyeballs on like the content that you're making and what you can bring to the table. John, I'm curious from your perspective. I hear a lot uh, in you know talking with kind of more traditional agents that they all say, now having an Instagram following, having a Twitter following can be helpful in the casting process. You've you've kind of come into creating co social content a little bit differently in your career. Is that something you hear about? Is that something people bring up to you? How are you thinking about building out your audience beyond the shows that you're on? Well, when it comes to like social media, uh, it's the thing I hate but I love at the same time because a lot of uh, attention I've gotten was from creating social media content. Like when they were doing the uh, mannequin challenge, I switched it up and I did it as a movie. I did like a movie of Boys in the Hood. I reenacted Boys in the Hood, a scene from Boys in the Hood in a mannequin challenge style. Um, I reenacted a scene from The Wood in a mannequin style and that went viral. Those went viral hits. But, um, it's like, and also like when I'm trying to create content, as far as like trying to get things produced, a lot of people want to, especially like a lot of YouTube companies that like produce content, I, they want someone that has like a follower, following base. So therefore they know that the client, that whoever, whatever person they're investing money into is going to give them back their dollars. So I have to build a social media following and I have to build a fan base on social media. And also my niece loves it, so I have to like make sure I build it just for her as well too. <laughs> your your family is the most important audience, right? Facts. Um, so, one of the things that I feel like makes all three of you so unique is is the fact that you are creating content for lots of different platforms and and thinking about not just what people are watching on their TV, but what they're watching on their phone. Zach, you started on YouTube. You went to Vine. Vine is no longer around. Now you're on Instagram. How have you, throughout your career, thought about and kind of being able to move audiences to different places and to create content for different platforms? Yeah, I was intrigued by what Sam Raimi said earlier. How you know he creates specifically for one platform, and his is mostly the silver screen, the big screen. And when I was in film school about 2008, starting, I thought that was my dream to, to shoot for the silver screen and make something that would be you know surround sound in a theater. But yeah, when we're looking at our, creating our content now, we specifically look at every single platform individually, you know, Instagram, and that's a one by one frame for us. Um, and and the, one of the biggest differences is, is specifically in the framing, we love to get our viewer into the story right away. And that means you're gonna be, it's awkwardly close. The camera's gotta be closer to you. Physically, we actually can see in the videos that do well versus not doing well. Like, if my face is visibly like 70% of the screen in the beginning, that makes a big difference because you know the screens that people are watching on are very small compared to what you're watching Spider-Man, you know, at home on your TV or in the theater. On so we specifically care about those formats as well as you know when we shoot a lot of branded stuff it's funny today but we have to ask the clients you know is this going to be a vertical video versus uh, a one by one video or is this a video that people are going to turn on YouTube on their mobile so that plays a big part but for us to get our audience engaged in the content right away it's framing it's the sound even though it's usually not on for 40 percent of the viewers and figuring out you know visually. How do you set up the scene so they know the story? Because again, we're trying to capture their their attention within you know two seconds. So does this make it harder because you have to think about how to do something for Facebook specifically or for Instagram specifically, and then for YouTube? Or are you able to kind of make one thing and, and put it lots of different places? I don't know about you guys, but I specifically try not to repost everything everywhere because the formats do change. And, and it's actually, I think a bigger thing is just the audiences are different on those platforms. Uh, Facebook video may not do well on YouTube at all um, because there's even just different lengths and, and very little nuances that you have to pay attention to. 
and even there is different algorithms. Like if you're posting a video on YouTube, it's all about watch time. So getting someone to watch as long of a video for as long as possible. But for Instagram, you have a minute. And so it's, it's definitely catering the content. And then if you want someone to follow you cross platform, you have to give them a reason to. So if I'm giving you the same stuff on Twitter that you can get on my Instagram, why would you follow me both places? So I think it's about catering to the specific platform and working with the tools that the platform gives you and you have at your disposal. So, so then give us a sense of, of when you're creating content for, for digital, what does that schedule look like? What are your, not, not, don't give us your full days here, but like, you know, how many videos are you posting a week? How long does it take to do that? It seems like you're having to produce a lot and a high volume in order to meet people in all those different places. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Big videos, lots, all the time. <laughs> so how are you doing that? <laughs> you, you tell me. I mean, I'm just so tired. Um, no, I, I think it's all, it's w like with anything, like a, with anything where you're working from home primarily, it's about finding what works for you and figuring out ways to stay motivated. And I think staying consistent is so, so, so important. So even if you decide like you're posting every other week or if you're posting once a week or five times a week, it's about maintaining that schedule and keeping it consistent so your audience knows what to expect. When I used to do online content, I used to just spend a day a day out of the week and just create like five or ten pieces of content and then start posting them throughout the week. Like schedule it out, shoot out one day, shoot out one day, plan it the next weekend, and then start scheduling out when I'm going to post w um, what video on what platform. You talk a lot about kind of what, what your audience wants and meeting your audience at the kind of the right platform or the right place. I know that the relationship that you have with, with fans, with an audience online is very different than the one that you might have with someone who's sitting in a movie theater and watching you on a big screen. Can any one of you can take this? Like, can you talk a little bit about kind of how, how that relationship works and, and why it, it's different than, than kind of more traditional actors and actresses and their fans? Of course, yeah. I mean, I think it's a very, very intimate relationship. But with that being said, there's things that for your own mental health, you have to decide like to keep to yourself or to sort of just hold in your own. So it's it's drawing the line of like what, how much do I give to people slash how much do I owe people about myself? And then I would say to anyone, the most important thing about making digital content, regardless of if it's scripted or if it's like really cool special effects or just anything you want to make is having your perspective and your point of view because I think if you keep your brand involved in everything you do, you can really touch a lot of things and you can try a lot of stuff out. It's just all about coming from that perspective that is the way you see the world. Yeah, it's something that I love about social media and I think why the younger generation has attached to it so much is because it's a very personal relationship with the creators you're watching. You're literally, you know, whether it's in your room or in school or wherever, you have your phone so close to you. It's not like an experience. You go to the theater, you pay the person, and you're sitting with a bunch of people watching this content. That's, uh, But it's very personal to watch it one-on-one, -on -one and, and that's why when we meet fans in real life, I think all of us have experienced it. They want to hug you. They want to talk to you like, you know, they're catching up on they knew what you did two days ago. And so it's up to each creator to draw the line on and how far it goes into your personal personal life. Some people are very open. Um, myself, I kind of like put out the magic videos and then reclude into my, my actual personal life, you know, with my family. So uh, there's different lines, but it is amazing. But I think it's a benefit for us creators to have these fans that it's not just, it's like a Brad, Fitt, uh, Brad Pitt relationship to a movie star um, where they've seen you on the screen. It's They actually really know you because of the videos they've tuned in for all these years on a regular basis. Now, I know each one of you is, is working on or has kind of recently come out with some kind of interesting projects that are a little bit maybe off platform for you. Before we, we get into that, Bo, why don't you give us, kind of set the stage for us about, you know, how how it, what, what the business of being a, a digital star is today in terms of, you know, they've got YouTube, they're touring, uh, they've got book deals. How does that all work together to create a kind of a viable business for someone? Yeah, there's a couple things that I think we talk about, kind of media theory that's changed. One is um, once you get to kind of these guys' level, uh, Talent and the, the line between a talent and what we would call a, a content brand or affinity brand starts to blur, right? And you really, and what they were kind of speaking to about how the audience really connects, so much of that is, is you're, you're part owned by the audience in a way that I don't think the historical 
movie star kind of was, right? And, and Alexis really is like a brand. I know it's probably gross to say, but like... Oh, I'm a brand. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and she is in a way that I, you know, maybe the Brad Pitts and Angelina Jolie's in the past were, but TV actor X wasn't, right? And I think that, so you've got, I'd say that's kind of one, right? And so when you start to say, if I'm an affinity brand and I have an audience that cares about me, what does that audience want and what do I super serve them with? And when you look at, again, whether it's a corporation or a, and a, you know, we own a company called Rooster Teeth, which is a big affinity brand, $100 million a year, you know, same thing. It's, it's really the same revenue streams that everybody's exploiting. It starts with social, it goes into brand deals, it eventually becomes, can I make my own content, can I act or whatever? There's live events, there's books, there's merchandising. It's about those six are the primaries, six, six or seven are the primary kind of wheel of value there. And so full screen has been essentially set up to meet every single one of those needs um, so that we can kind of be a Swiss army knife to help whatever any of these guys need, there's a solution built in for it. And it, it expands even further into like Zach, for example, like. I won't say numbers, but does very well on uh, rights management, what we'd call just stolen content on YouTube, where people have taken his Vine clips and put it all over. And again, that's not something WME was like trying to figure out how to help talent with five years ago, um, but it's, it's real for everybody. And so we have to add it to the quiver. I'm going to go down the line here uh, and ask you about some of the projects you've had. Alexis, you have It's All Good, your podcast. Um, I know that you were talking about thinking about how to take you know, what people love about you and translate it to different areas. How, how do you do that in podcast form when, when you're not on camera in the same way? Sure. Well, my podcast is currently on hiatus, but sort of my attitude with podcasting is YouTube is so short and clippy and fast. And especially with like the kind of content I'm really interested in making long term, I want to do like scripted. I want to do jokes. I don't want to keep it all about me. And so the podcast sort of keeps the audience satiated in that way where it's a much more like intimate kickback environment where I'm asking genuine questions with guests that I want to get to know. Um, on a more personal, like casual level. And I think it, it keeps up that sort of, as we're talking about, you have a very personal relationship with your audience and it sort of keeps that almost at bay. So I can like go flop around on YouTube and like write some stuff and direct some stuff. Yeah, so how, how do you balance kind of keeping YouTube and every other social platform that you're on kind of maintained while you do start to pursue more acting projects and creating and, and you know working on your own stuff outside of that? Sure, that's a really good question. I think a big part of it is letting your audience into as much of it as possible. Like I'm a huge fan of like using Instagram stories, especially as a way to be like, hello, I'm doing this here now. This is what I think about it. This is why you should care about it. And just keep, the more involved that you can keep them in your life, the more interested they are six months from now in seeing the final project or seeing me act in a movie that they saw behind the scenes of like a few months ago. Um, and then again, I think it really just comes back to like keeping that perspective and keeping that point of view. And as long as you, as Bo sort of saying, like maintain your brand and maintain, I bring the brand of Alexis into whatever project I'm doing, it keeps them interested in seeing that then the final product. John, as we talk a lot about this idea of like building a brand, how do you think about that? I mean, you had a kind of a really big moment this last year with Insecure. Um, it was a big, big role for you, kind of put you on the map in a lot of ways. Like, do, is that something? Do you do you need to build a brand? Is that something you're thinking about? What are What are you doing? Yes, I, I and that's something that Full Screen is helping me with, like um, developing a brand and curating my Instagram and my Facebook and carrying it to like a certain type of audience. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking about that, and I am also thinking about like the type of content I'm putting out, like what type of content, what, how is this being shot, what type of things I'm putting out there into the world, especially with something like Insecure that just came out, and then with this third season coming out, and you want to be careful not to put out anything because this is like the building blocks of something that's for, for longevity. So I'm very careful on that, and uh, Full Screen just helped me guide me in that process. Zach, you recently released a book, uh, and and there's a kind of a fun app component to it as well that I was playing around with the other day in my office. So what what can you tell us? I mean, what what prompted you to to take what you were doing and then create a book? It doesn't seem like it's a logical. Yeah, yeah. I have a really yeah. young fan base, and the book for me was twofold. One, to answer a question, I and mean, when I'm out for dinner with my wife, you know, young kids will come up and say like, "Hey, do a magic trick for me," or like, "Why are you magical?" 
And I used to give them the fun, kind of like the ILM breakdown you just saw, like, well, it's visual effects, you know, we, we shoot it like this, and they walk away kind of sad, like, that's, 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 I'm going to unfollow him. Because um, it wasn't, you know, they believe, it's like Disneyland, you believe in this magical world, and I recently shot a video um, down in Disney World, Florida, and I got to see behind the scenes, and you're, you know, it's odd to see Cinderella smoking a cigarette and behind, like, backstage. It's, it ruins the magic for you. So I wanted to write a book that uh, talked about a middle grade, you know, version of myself. And he's got a magical family, but for some reason he's not magical. So he goes, he's sent to public school, and he makes all these friends, and of course figures out he's magical, and everything goes, you know, kind of like my videos, wrong all the time. But we wanted the the book to physically manifest kind of this magic. So we had an AR uh, component, so my team created an app and animated it all. So every illustration in the book literally pops up on the book in a fun, creative way and animates or tells a part of the story. Just as like bonus content, you can still get the full story reading it, but it was a fun passion project. I've always wanted to kind of write. But the other reason we did it is also, you know, I only have physically so much time to be in all the videos, so we were hoping this is another way to kind of build the brand where I, I don't actually have to be on set to make it happen, or you know, I can have a team of writers eventually take over and continue the series. And, and you sold the rights to Amblin, uh, which is great. Why, why not keep that to yourself and try to make that project yourself? You're a filmmaker. When Spielberg's company calls you, you just <laughs> say, take it, you, you got it, go with it. So, and this can be for all of you guys here as we, we start to, to wrap up a little bit. I'm curious, in, in 2017 being, I kind of posed this question to Bo at the start about you know being a creator, being a storyteller is different. What do you think is the most exciting thing about being a storyteller in 2017? What's the, what's the stuff that you're most excited about doing? I mean, I always say if nothing else, the main thing that I have learned from social media and the main thing I will take away from it is that I was excited about storytelling and I wanted to make stuff and it forced me to do it and it forced me to do it weekly and it forced me to do it all the time. And I feel like that's half the battle in terms of having any creative passion or like wanting to do anything is just getting yourself to start. And that's, that's the most important thing I've learned from doing social media is if you want to do anything, you just do the take the first step. And then if you make your first video and it's terrible, then you learn and the next time it's a little bit better. And I think that's really the most exciting thing about how accessible it is to just create stuff is whether you're 12 or 50, you can make something and then if it's not good, you can try more and just do it and physically like take the steps. Whereas before I think it was a little bit harder to, you know, get access to like cameras and before like DSLRs and before it was just like so accessible. But you can do anything. Well not to cut you up, but even just hearing you talk about your FX show and development and the pace of that versus this, it's the immediacy would probably be the other thing I'd throw in. Not that I'm a creator or know anything that I'm talking oh, about. But you know something. <laughs> it all happens right now fast. I just like the fact that with today you can do literally whatever you want. Like you could wake up one day and say, hey, I want to create this short film. And then you can start creating a short film. And you don't necessarily need to wait for people to help you make this thing happen. You could literally do it yourself with your phone, with a friend. You could just shoot the shit around your house. And you could come up with different scenes. And you could write whatever it is you like. And there's so much information out there that makes it so accessible that you can just go online and learn how to write learn how to do all these certain things so you can create whatever it is you like and tell the story you want to tell. So that's what I love about now. Yeah, what I love is that, you know, even like this morning, just posting a video to my audience without any executives, you know, over the shoulder looking. And um, it's different than any other projects, you know, whether brand deals, which are awesome because they pay the bills, but there is a level of, you know, collaboration with the brand that has to happen. Whereas, like everyone's saying, we control our audience in the distribution and have in immediacy to clicking, you know, post and eight hours later, a couple million views. And that's, that's, you, you, that's what we live for. It's so interesting to hear you all talk about that. Uh, you know, the idea that you can, you can do all of this without that kind of middleman or that other person there, but then you're all, you know, working on kind of more traditional stuff too. So I'm curious in any of you who wants to take it, um, how do you, how do you weigh that like feeling of like when you're when you're making your own video, you're doing it all and you get to have a hand in everything versus when you're, you know, acting in something or, you know, a, a writer, you, you don't get to necessarily call all the shots. Yeah, you don't necessarily get to call all the shots, but it's still a collaborative effort. You know, you're working with people, you're usually working with people you like working with. Um, like a lot of the 
like working on Insecure, even on um, ABC on uh, American Crime, like they allowed me to switch some of the things and switch some of the script a little bit. On Insecure, they allowed me to improv a little bit as well. So it's like a collaborative effort whenever you're working with someone in anyways. And you're usually not there because you didn't want to be there. You're there because you want to be there and you want to work with these people. So it's fun in that aspect. And it's just, you just get a, you get to reach a bigger audience doing working with so much people too. I think also it's it's made me so much more fortunate when I do get the chance to work with other people. Like I recently did a Google Pixel. Uh, we got some Google people. I did a Google Pixel 2 video um, that was produced like by Google and so I was able to write a script. And when I showed up, there were like the props that I wrote into the script and there was like someone who was shooting it that wasn't me. And it was like the best thing ever because we were all working together on the same project but I didn't have to move the camera or like move the light a little bit or like get in frame and like flip the thing and like look at it and then like switch the focus and then like look at it again and then like record a clip, you know? So, okay, I'm getting the, the wrap it up signal, but one of the things I love to ask anyone I talk to these days is, because I think it's a very um, elucidating question, is like how you are watching content, consuming content today, whether it's, you know, an, an app you're really obsessed with or the way you're watching TV, so a like, quick fire down the line. Binge watching. <laughs> I just binge watch everything. Like if it's a good show, I just sit at home and just watch it. On Netflix? On Netflix, on, on my phone. Um, yeah, and Netflix on my phone. Yeah, I, I definitely don't have cable, so it's all streaming platforms or, yeah, sitting down, binging a bunch. I actually subscribe to four cable networks or four four cable bundles just trying to play with all of them. Um, recommend Fubo TV if you're interested in a non-traditional one. Good for sports, too. That's why. If you like soccer, Fubo TV. $35 a month, free, uh, free marketing. Are you a sponsor, Bo? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a team down in LA, and I usually, you know, for a while, app world kind of for me goes stale, but um, lately, I don't know if you guys have heard of, about an app called HQ, but we were literally, like, all my coworkers are using HQ, and I haven't yet done the live stream but I, we signed up, and we're like 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock. So I, I love new stuff like that that come up and uh, get us excited again. Like, oh, there is, there is finally a new iteration of something, a game show that, you know, we can develop or, or think about. For those of you who don't know, HQ is this kind of fun interactive trivia game, and it happens every day at noon and at 6 p.m. So if we're not careful, everyone's going to stop paying attention later and <laughs> start playing. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you.